Welcome to Landing Place Church. We are so glad you're here, whether you're in person or online today. If you're our guest today, we would love to get to know you. Text new to the number below and we'll send you a link to our connection card. Also, if you're in person and new today, don't forget to stop by Connection Central before you leave. We have a gift for you as our way of saying thank you just for checking us out. What should I do if I want to know what's going on at LPC? You can check out our top three on our app or on our website under I'm Family. Oh yeah, you should check out our social media. I happen to know our social media manager. She's pretty cool. <laughs> Today we're continuing our series, Lies We Believe About Love. Honey, what's one lie you believed about love? I thought you were going to keep on packing my lunch after we got married. <laughs> You're so cute, I love you. <laughs> what can we expect from service today? First, let's worship through music, a message from Pastor Mark, and we'll finish up with generosity. It's easy to give. You can text landing place to the number below, or we have ushers ready to receive gifts on your way out. Let's stand, stand up, up and, and worship. worship. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Good. You happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God, we are so grateful to be in your presence today, Lord. We worship you, amen. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Lord this morning. Would you lift up that shout of praise to him right now? Amen. The presence of the Lord is in this house. Amen. Come on. Praise you, God.
Let's lift up our hands. And I want you to tell him who he is. So let's lift up names of God. Let's tell him who he is. You are faithful. Come on, church, help me out. Let's speak his name. Let's lift him up. Alpha, Omega.
other name like the name of Jesus. Speak his name, church, Jesus. Sing his name, speak his name over the circumstance that's facing you right now in your life. Jesus is greater. Jesus is stronger. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus, we praise you that you are holding all things together. You are holding our life together. You are holding the chaos, the brokenness of our lives and throughout this world. You are holding it all together. So we breathe in your presence right now and we ex exhale, we breathe out your praise. You are worthy of every bit of praise that we have offered today. And we owe everything to you, God. We lift up the name that is above every name. We exalt him over our home, over our family, over our marriages, over our relationships, over our job. Jesus is greater. It's at the name of Jesus that makes the darkness flee and tremble. So Jesus, we hide ourselves in you today. We are your church and we know that you have the victory. We give you all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. It's in Jesus' mighty, matchless name I pray all of this. Amen, amen. Go ahead and turn around and say hi to a few people. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Y'all doing good? You ready for some church? It is great to have you here. If you're joining us online, it's great to have you with us, too. We're in week two of a series on relationships. We're talking about getting along together, and we learned last week that when relationships are good, life is good. And relationships are bad, life is bad. And so we're working on how do we have better relationships I was a sophomore in college when my relationship with my wife, now wife, Karen, began. I was a sophomore. She was a senior. We began dating in the end of March, her senior year. We dated about a month and a half before she graduated and moved three and a half hours away, and I have five years of school left. And we have to DTR. We got to define this relationship. Are we like in it? Are we are not in it? Are we staying in it? Where are we at? We said, you know what? I think it's worth pursuing. And so we we pursue and we pursue and we pursue, and after a couple years, I'm feeling confident that I have got her to love me as much as I love her. I say, will you marry me? And she says, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> I worked on her another couple years. Will you marry me? <laughs> hey, this is a lesson in persistence, folks, all right? <laughs> Fail, try, try again. She said, yes, and we get married. And so we got married in the late 1900s, right here. <laughs> Karen looks exactly like she does now. I look like that. A little different is how I look with hair and brownish hair. And uh, we had so look, we were so looking forward to getting married because we, I, we spent every minute up until getting married either working or in school. She was working, I was in school, um, and we got to see each other very limited amounts. We would see each other every Friday night for about three hours. We would meet at a mall, which is about halfway. We were about an hour and a half away from each other. And so honestly, although we had dated for years and years and years, we had actually spent very little time actually being together for longer periods of time. So we were so looking forward to getting married. We were so looking forward to going on our honeymoon, and we're going to go. What is the Hardacre's favorite vacation? Cruise. cruise. We're going to cruise. So she books a cruise for us, and we're going to go on a cruise, and we're very excited about going on this particular cruise. And uh, the first sign that this might be a rough week was when we walked in the cruise door and we found this. <laughs> like, huh. So the 
fairly narrow space. Now, some of you are thinking, wow, that's pretty romantic. I mean, it's your honeymoon, and you got like a, a couch to sleep on together. And it's not. It's not at all. And it was a rough cruise. It's a cruise line that does not exist anymore. It's called Premier. It was an old boat. The food was bad. The seas were rough. People were throwing up everywhere. It was a disaster. It was a horrible way to start marriage. And we came home from our honeymoon, and we were both unhappy. Uh, you know, nobody's really at their best when you're not happy. And so that first week, honestly, there was just a lot of conflict. It was not everything we thought it was going to be. And you know, from the beginning of your life, your parents read you stories about fairy tales and Cinderella, and then you grow up and you watch movies and Netflix series, and there's always this couple, and against all odds, they, they finally come together at the end of the story, the end of the book, the end of the fable, the end of the series, and they live happily ever after, right? As Americans, we sort of believe that happiness is more than just a goal. It's, it's sort of a right, is it not? And we have the right to be happy written within the Declaration of Our Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And they're, they're endowed by their creator, he brings God into this, with certain unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and say it with me, the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. We believe that we deserve to be happy, and, and in this series, we're talking about lies we believe about love. And we're saying that there's some lies out there that we bought into as a culture, and we bought into them as a culture, they've messed up our relationships. And the lie we're going to uncover today is this, and they lived happily ever after. Now, some of you are immediately saying, Mark, I mean, isn't that the goal? I mean, we, we want to be happy. Is there anything wrong with being happy? Absolutely not. There are times in your relationship you are going to be very happy. Some of the best times in my life have been spent with Karen, absolute best. But it always isn't always happy. And the challenge is if we go into a relationship thinking we're always going to be happy and the goal of this relationship is actually my happiness, here's the challenge. At some point in time, you will say to yourself, I'm not happy. And so what do we do? We revert back to last week's lie, I think I found the wrong person. I just need to find the right person. And so we bounce from relationship to relationship to relationship, trying to find this elusive thing called happiness, which we believe we're entitled to. Now, last week, we learned that God has this sort of plan for marriage. Actually, marriage was God's idea from the very beginning. This book that we call the Bible, this collection of books, really begins with the marriage and it ends with the marriage. And actually, everything in between becomes sort of a, a, a whole clinic, if you will, on how to run relationships and how to do them really well. And the further we've gotten away from this, the more our relationships have suffered. Last week, we introduced this concept that there's an opponent of God who tries to lie to us and tries to get us to believe things that are not true. Name Satan, devil, enemy, thief. Last week, we learned that he's a liar. Jesus had said in John 8, he's a liar. He's the father of lies. Everything that comes out of his mouth is a lie. Today, if we skip ahead just a couple chapters to John 10, Jesus unveils another little bit of this enemy, this thief, this liar. He said this, the thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and destroy. You've got an enemy who wants to train wreck your marriage if you're married. He wants to ruin your relationships if you're single. He wants to destroy your life. And because relationships are such an integral part of our life, if he can ruin our relationships, he can make us pretty miserable. We don't want that. So I thought it'd be good to kind of unpack some of the tactics of the enemy so that we can recognize them and go, oh, I know what that is. So we don't buy into the lie, so we experience everything that God has for us. So I want to look at three tools of the enemy. And I would tell you that most of this series is born out of three things. First, my own personal experience. Been married 33 years. We do not have it all figured out, but we're learning along the way. The second is I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time with a lot of you and see various spots in your relationships and various things that would have happened and various struggles and learned a lot there. The third is God's word. He has so much to say about this. And so let's give you three enemy tactics to steal, kill, and destroy our relationships. The first is this, selfishness. 
If people ask me, Mark, what is the number one thing that breaks up relationship? What is the number one issue? I would tell you, we are basically selfish people. We're selfish. How many of your parents? How many think your kids are selfish when they're born? <laughs> Feed me, change me, put me to bed, change my diaper. Oh my goodness, can't you do anything for yourself? <laughs> no. We're born selfish. One of the first things you have to teach your kids as parents is you got to share. It's not yours. You have to share. Why do we have to teach that? Because inherently, we are born into selfishness. Now, here's the challenge. As we grow up, as we become adults, we see selfishness in other people. We don't see it as readily in ourselves. So, All of a sudden, God throws two people together in a relationship, and you look at the other person and think, oh my gosh, you are selfish. (laughs) You are incredibly selfish. You think the world revolves around you. We see it so clearly in someone else, and they're thinking the exact same thing about you. They're thinking you're the most selfish person they've ever met in their entire life. Why is that? Because we don't see selfishness in ourselves, but we see it in other people. And the enemy gets in and he uses that selfishness to begin to pull us apart and divide us and to separate us. We just tend to get selfish. Now, the second enemy tool is this. I would say it's unrealistic expectations. We all sort of have expectations coming into a relationship, and we, especially when we're in the infatuation stage of a relationship where everything is good about the other person, they're so cute, what they do is so cute, and you're just so lovable, and we just love every little thing they do. There's nothing I don't like about you. And that lasts about six months to a year, and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, that's super irritating. Like, you need to stop doing that. So cute a while ago, but no, it's not cute anymore. We go in to relationships with a variety of expectations, and unfortunately, most of those expectations are presented to us by movies, by series, by TV, by all kinds of other things. And we go in thinking that, hey, there's going to be a problem, but it's going to get resolved within the 30 minutes, and we're going to be good, and everybody's going to be great, not a big deal. And when that doesn't happen, we go, ooh, this isn't working for me anymore. This is not good. We have these expectations that are just outrageously high that nobody can possibly meet. Third thing, we get things out of order. God established a really, really clear order for relationships. And many of you today will look at this order that God has, and you may think, well, that's old-fashioned. Well, that's really, man, that's, that's like 2,000 years ago. But Actually, the order that God gave us for relationship is actually timeless, and I think one of the reasons we have so many challenges today is that we get this out of order. So what is the order? God says, look, the first part of connecting with somebody is going to be spiritually. You want to make sure that you're on the same spiritual page, you're both tracking, you're both after the same thing spiritually, we connect there first. If you look at Adam and Eve, the very first relationship, their first connection was with God first before they ever connected with each other. They're connected with God. Then the next phase was you're connected spiritually. Now we start to connect emotionally. We see if there's any emotional connection. If I like you, if you like me, if we agree on some things, that's really cool. Now God says in the order, if you connected spiritually, if you connected emotionally and you want to take this to marriage, you get married and now you begin a physical relationship. Notice the order, spiritual, emotional, physical. This is God's order. Our culture has taken God's order and flipped it upside down completely. What is the nature of relationships today? You're cute. I want to hook up. Let's go ahead and hook up, and we're going to go ahead and bounce from physical relationship to physical relationship to physical relationship. We're going to see how that works. And if if we connect physically, we may get around, or actually may not, ever getting to connect emotionally. And at some point in time, we may have some spiritual conversations, but quite honestly, that is so far down the road that that's just not a big deal. And we wonder why relationships aren't working and why we have this incredible lack of satisfaction, this lack of fulfillment, but it's because we've gotten things so incredibly out of order. Jesus um, had a lot to say about this, and uh, we're going to talk about the counterparts of all three of these things. But before we do that, I want to go into one more little bit of the verse of John 10.10. 10. He said, the purpose of the thief is to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm so glad he didn't stop there. Let me tell you my purpose, Jesus said. He goes on with the verse, John 10.10. 10. My purpose is to give them a rich and a satisfying life. 
The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they would have a rich and satisfying. How many of you would rather have a rich and satisfying life? Oh, like, yeah, right? Sounds good, right? If we go back to the original text, which is Greek, that this is written in, there's one word for rich and satisfying. Our three words in English comes from one Greek word, perison, P-E-R-I-S-S-O-N. If you really translate that, it could be translated in a lot of ways, and if you look at different versions of the Bible, they're translated differently. One is abundantly. I came to give them abundant life. One is extraordinary. I came to give them extraordinary life. And one is more. I came to give them more. The big idea for today is this, that if the lie is and they live happily ever after, then the big idea is that God wants more than just happiness for us. He wants more than happiness. So... We're sitting around at the table two days ago. My daughter, Sydney, who's been married about two and a half years now, is sitting at the kitchen table, and we're just talking. We're not talking about church. We're not talking about the series. She wasn't even here last week. We're not talking about marriage. And out of the blue, she goes, you know what I hate, Dad? I don't, but I have a feeling it's something either I did, I'm doing, or I'm about to do. (laughs) You know, I hate it when married people... Tell non-married people how terrible the first year of marriage is and how bad their honeymoon was. Wow, that's a problem. Because in about 48 hours, that's exactly about half my message. (laughs) She goes, that wasn't my experience at all. She goes, we had a great honeymoon. We had a great first two and a half years of marriage. And she goes, I hate it when married people just put this on us like it's going to be bad. I'm like, you know what? That's a really good check. Because... There are going to be moments in your relationship that are happy, and there's going to be times that they aren't very happy. For us, the first year was a really difficult year. For other people, she goes, we had a great two and a half years. We had a great honeymoon. And so I started to ask the question, huh, I wonder why that is. Why was our relationship so so much of a struggle, and why was yours so good? And of course, I came to one conclusion. You must have had great parents. (laughs) No, I didn't say that. Karen and I probably bought into some lies that I think our culture really bought into, and I think we fell into some selfishness trap. We had some very unrealistic expectations, and I think order-wise, actually, order-wise, we were probably better at than the other two. But we really walked in um, probably not ready, really prepared as well. Sydney and her husband, Andrew, really walked into marriage just in a lot better place. And they embrace three truths that I want to give you today that is sort of the opposite of the three lies that the enemy gives us. And I think if we do these things, and again, whether you're married today, whether you're single, whether you're sort of in between relationships, you're in a situationship where it's complicated, no matter where you're at, there's there's some things here for you today. So what are they? Discovering the more God has for us. The first more God has for us is this. We need to shift from consumer relationships to covenant relationships. And I know both of those words are going to need some defining today. What is a consumer relationship? A consumer relationship is one in which where the individual's need, my need, your need, is put above the relationship. What's a consumer relationship? It's when we buy things. So when COVID came along and everybody else was hunkering down and everybody else was quarantined and everybody else was isolating, Hardacre saw this as a buying opportunity for travel. Literally. We followed all the rules. We wore the mask. We distanced. We did it. You know what? This is a fantastic time to travel because nobody else is traveling. And they offered us five flights to Las Vegas for $66. Not $66 a piece, $66 total, which now becomes a stewardship issue. Right? It's like, we can't afford not to go. I have zero relationship with airlines, none. There's some airlines I like better than others. There's some that, that, that I would rather fly. There are actually some I won't fly at all. But the truth is, we probably flew 12 to 13 times within the COVID period when it was at its worst. We flew about, I just added it up the other day, we added, uh, flew about six different carriers. We have no relationship with airlines. We have no loyalty to airlines. Frankly, if you can get us there safely, get our luggage there at a really good price, that's a consumer relationship. The individual is above the relationship. I have no relationship. That's consumeristic. 
Now, the challenge is when that sort of thinking creeps into our relationships. What is consumerism driven on? It's driven on two things. I want to entice you, and I want to impress you. Enticing is advertising, consumer. Southwest, Frontier, United. As soon as, I, as soon as I know I'm flying, man, I get ads in my feeds. I get ads everywhere. They want to entice me to use their product. And they're going to compete on price. And then once we get on board, they want to impress us. Same way with relationships. Gentlemen, we tend to fall into the impress category. Guys, we try to impress women, don't we? We do really stupid things to try to impress you. We jump off buildings. We buy really loud cars. We, do, we just do crazy things because we want to impress you because if we impress you, we feel like we can draw you in. Women, you like to entice. You like filters. You like them eyelashes that, like, I don't even know how you lift your eyes, some of y'all. I'm like, I'm like, as an eye doctor, I'm like, you have the strongest eyelids I have ever seen on a woman. Like, I don't know how you live. I don't know how you get those things back up. It's like push-ups. Like, after a while, you think you just get tired. Just boom. <laughs> we live in a world of impressing and enticing. That's what we do. And then we're surprised when we get into a relationship that's based on impression, based on enticement. We're surprised when that person no longer impresses us when they no longer look quite as enticing, that we look for somebody who's more impressive, that's more enticing, and we move on to another relationship. That's a consumer relationship. Jesus entered an entirely new topic. He said, I want to introduce to you a covenant relationship. A covenant relationship is exactly the opposite. We're going to talk about a lot of opposites today. He said, a covenant relationship is one in which we put the, the relationship above the individual needs. The relationship comes first, and then the individual needs. You're going to find this hard to believe, but I used to have a barber. <laughs> and a great relationship with a barber. I went to the same guy for about 30 years. Um, and his name was Van, and we I probably started when I was 15 years old. And we would connect about once a month, and I really liked Van. He liked me. We were just good friends. They went to our church. I loved hanging with this guy. We just I, I, I looked forward to going. In fact, if he was on vacation, I would wait There's probably cheaper places I could have gone. There are probably different places I could have gone. But I had this relationship developed to the point where I put the relationship above the individual need. I continue to go to Van. I mean, I have nothing but like a rim, a tiny rim of hair left. And I'm still showing up. My hair did not need to be cut. It did not need to be cut by a professional. But I continue to go. Why? Because I have a relationship. The relationship means more to me than whatever I'm paying to have done. The relationship is above the individual need. That's a covenant relationship relationship. Jesus goes, look, I'm calling you into covenant relationships where it's not just the latest and the greatest and the person who impresses you the most and the one who's the most enticing. We're going to make a commitment to somebody, and actually the relationship is going to supersede what we feel like our individual need is in this relationship. Completely different concept. Put a verse around this for you. Jesus said this, Matthew 19, 4 through 9, He said, haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record that from the very beginning, God made them male and female. And he said this, this explains why a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one covenant relationship. How do we know it's a covenant relationship? Because of this next line. Since the two are no longer, are there no longer two but one, Let no one split what God has joined together. He says, look, this relationship I'm putting you in, it's it's forever. Like this isn't until the next best thing comes along. This isn't until you get tired of it. This is forever. This is a covenant relationship. Now I know, having said that, there are many, many, many of you who have been divorced and you're saying, gee, where does that put me? You know what? It puts you exactly where God wants you to be today. Divorce isn't the unpardonable sin. Divorce isn't the end of the world. Divorce is just something that God didn't want because he really created you for something so much more. The cool thing is God can take a broken relationship and we apply the principles, he can bring something fantastic out of the next relationship. And that's a cool thing. And I'm so glad that God does that uh, because it's just huge. All right, so the first thing, we're going to move from consumer relationships to covenant relationships. The second truth is this. We have to right-size our expectations. 
We have to go into a relationship knowing this person is not always going to make me happy. In fact, there's going to be times where I get really frustrated with them. There's going to be times when I get angry with them. There's going to be times where I'm just overwhelmed with the burden in this relationship. I get it. I know that it's not just about happiness. I have to go into that expectation. There's going to be great moments. There's going to be challenging moments. But what covenant says is I'm going to stay with the person in the hard moments because I know that it's not going to last forever. There's going to be better moments coming up. How do we do that? You know, I marry a lot of people. And if you do traditional vows, which a lot of people do, you know, it's sort of, you know, do you take this person for better or worse? For richer or poorer? In sickness and in health. And you know what brides and grooms here? Better, richer, health. No one ever goes into a marriage thinking that it's going to be worse, that it's going to be poorer, that it's going to be in sickness. No one ever envisions when they're standing at the altar being married that they may be sitting beside a hospital bed one day with their spouse in it. We don't think that because we've been, we sort of bought into this thing of expectations that everything's going to be phenomenal all the time and we're never going to have challenges and it's never going to be a problem. But God never said that. Jesus, or excuse me, Paul says this in Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, this means love your wives. Love your wives with a covenant love. Just as Christ loved the church, what did Christ do for the church? He gave his life up for her. What if God had a completely different expectation around marriage than we have? And I want to just float an idea by you. I'm going to let you stew on it a little bit. What if God brings two really broken people together? Broken people with baggage and issues and past histories and all kinds of mess. What if he brings two people together not so that they can just be happy? But what if they're brought together so that the selfishness that we don't see in ourselves, the brokenness that we don't see in ourselves or we refuse to deal with, the hurts that we, we refuse to address, what if he brings two people together so that they can reveal that to one another, so that they can actually get healing, so that they can actually get forgiveness, so that they can actually get better? What if God's whole purpose for marriage was so much more than just initial happiness? What if it was for a deep, long-lasting, healthy happiness? So when your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your fiance goes, ooh, you know what? You do? That's really irritating when you do that. It's more than irritating. I think it's just bad. And you go, maybe we actually need to address that. Maybe God has actually put that person in your life to point out something that actually needs some change to help us make a better person. We've got to right-size our expectations. In order to do that, if you're going to have that kind of relationship with somebody where they can speak into your life and you can speak into their life and they can point out sin that they see, because you can hide sin really well in public. But I'm telling you, you throw two people together in a really close, intimate relationship, and guess what? All your chunk gets revealed. You can't hide that stuff. It's going to bubble up, and they're going to call it out and go, whoa, 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 what, what's up with that? In order for that to be healthy and not just nagging and unhealthy, number three has to happen, and number three is this. We've got to pursue one who is pursuing Jesus. We've got to pursue the one who's pursuing Jesus. That second thing will never happen in this, unless this happens. Am I pursuing somebody that's also pursuing Jesus? You know, I think one of the greatest lies in our culture, and it's particularly in the church culture, is, you know what, where we're at on God, where we're at in spirituality, just isn't that big a deal. I mean, I believe this, and he believes that. I believe that. She believes this. But honestly, it's just not a big deal. I'll tell you what, it's a really huge deal to God. It's a huge deal to God. Don't buy into the lie that where the other person's at in their spiritual walk is not a big deal. It's a huge deal. You can go all the way back to the nation of Israel. They just left Egypt. They just left slavery for 400 plus years. It took them 40 years to get up to the point to get to the land that God had promised them. He goes, hey, we're going to cross the Jordan River and we're going to head west into the land that's now Israel. And he says, I'm giving you all of this, but hey, there's a little snag. The land is filled with other people. Here's what I don't want you to do. Whatever you do, 
do not marry them. Whatever you do, do not marry them. Now, some people will hold these verses up and this story up and go, oh, God is against multicultural marriages. He's against interracial marriages. This has nothing to do with race, and it has nothing to do with culture. It has everything to do with the gods you worship. The reason he said, do not marry these people, is because they worship other gods. And here's what I promise you. God said, if you intermarry with them, I promise you, and I'm warning you right up front, you are going to leave me, and you're going to begin to worship their gods, and this is not going to end well for you. I will kick you out of the land. And that's exactly what happened. If you follow history, they did move into the land. They did marry the people of the land. They did leave God, and God did expel them because of it. If you don't believe, you think, well, that's a great Old Testament story, but, you know, we're in the New Testament now, and we're not under law. That's great. Let's skip over to 2 Corinthians. Paul writes this about the context of marriage. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. Now, I want to be really clear here. This is in the context of marriage. He's not saying don't have unbelieving friends. He's not saying don't interact with them. He's not saying don't love them. He just want to be really clear. We're in the context of an intimate relationship. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of a living God. So many people, when they're dating, when they're looking for a spouse, again, we get the order mixed up. We're not thinking spiritual, emotional, physical. We're thinking, darn, she's cute. Man, he's handsome. Let's connect. Now we get down to spiritual. And a lot of young people today that I talk to will go, you know, we don't believe the same thing, but we're really close. Like, we, we agree on so many other things. I don't really think this is a big deal. And quite honestly, when you're dating, it doesn't seem like a big deal. I'm going to be honest with you. It's easy to, to dismiss. But here's the problem. Your faith system or lack of faith system is taking you on a journey in life. It's going to take you a direction. And when you start out, you're pretty close. But as time goes on, you begin to move in the vision of what you believe. And pretty soon, you believe different things about raising your kids than this person. You believe different things about finances than this person. You believe different things about everything. And the further you go in life, the further those two get apart. There are two visions that you have between the two of you, which is literally the definition of division. You are set up to be divided. And I could give you testimony after testimony of testimony of people who've gone down this road that said, if there was one mistake I made in my life, it was this one. And it's cost me every single day since. Doesn't mean we don't love people. It just means this is one thing we really need to be on the same page with. Because here's what it really comes down to. And this is why... And, and they live happily ever after is a lie. If we look to find our happiness through any other human being, whether it's your kids, whether it's a girlfriend, boyfriend, fiance, spouse, whether it's your parents, whether it's your boss, if we put our happiness on any other human being, we are setting up for failure. Because there is not another person in the world that can make you happy all the time. You're putting unrealistic expectations, and then when that person lets you down, you're going to believe, again, last week's lie and saying, I just need to find the right person. And you're going to keep bouncing from relationship to relationship, looking for the perfect person that doesn't exist. Let me give you just a little bit of truth as we close today. Psalm 37, 4, David writes this, seek your happiness in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. When we begin to take that expectation of our happiness off of other people and put it the only place where it really belongs and say, God, my happiness comes from you. My meaning and my purpose really come from you. And we get two people that actually do that in a relationship. It's pretty amazing how all of a sudden happiness sort of ensues. It just sort of follows and God begins to give you the desires of your heart. So I'd encourage you today, again, wherever you're at, whether you're single, married, this applies to everybody. We always have to check ourselves for selfishness. We've got to check ourselves and say, hey, am I putting unrealistic expectations on you? Am I putting on some expectations that actually you were never created 
to me. Only God could do that. Have I messed this order up? Have I turned upside down what God created? Because here's what I know when we move from consumer to covenant relationships, when we right size our expectation and realize that the purpose of marriage isn't happiness, but it's for me to become more like Jesus, then it makes a whole lot more sense that I want to pursue the one who is pursuing Jesus. And we do that, I'm telling you, you're going to set yourself up for a win in relationships. Let's pray. God, I'm so grateful for the power of your word, and I thank you that you wrote, literally wrote the book on relationships. God, today, probably all of us, myself included, are convicted by some of your truth. We look at this and we realize we've fallen short. We've messed up. God, I thank you that you're a God of forgiveness. You're not a God of condemnation, but you are a God of conviction. And I thank you that when we mess up, you don't condemn us. But instead, you offer forgiveness, and then you offer us the power through your Holy Spirit to make changes in our life. God, I pray that we would do relationships your way. And God, as we seek after you for our happiness, God, that you would give us the desires of our heart today. We thank you, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.